Hello, everyone. This is another episode of Unisoft Law YouTube show, which now is called What Ma Makes Lawyers Tick with uh, Plot Unisoft. And in this show, I bring fascinating people, uh, mostly from Toronto, but also from other parts of Canada to you and uh, let them speak for themselves. So today we have a really fascinating person. Her name is Monica Goyal. And uh, she's a director of legal innovation and a lawyer at Caraval Law. Without further ado, Monica is the best person to introduce herself. Hello, Monica. Hi, Pula. Uh, thank you for having me on your um, show. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, where do I start? <laughs> I think I think we're going to be talking a little bit about my journey, but just at a high level right now, I'm director of legal innovation at Caravel Law. But before that, um, I'm I'm also a lawyer. I had my own practice. Um, and I had developed a company called My Legal Briefcase uh, that was recently acquired by Caravel Law. Um, I had also started a company called Alluvion, and uh, you know that I had exited about three years ago. That continues to still be operating. And um, before that, I was an engineer, so I worked for several years in the tech industry. Um, I have a undergrad degree at Waterloo and a master's degree at Stanford, and so I'm quite steeped in tech as well. Monica, you know, I think multiple exits give someone the right to be called a serial entrepreneur. So I will call you a serial entrepreneur today, uh, and uh, you're not just a serial entrepreneur. Like you said, you also went to Stanford. You went to Waterloo, so you have the engineering pedigree. So it's almost like a classic Silicon Valley uh, startup entrepreneur you are, right? So, but you're also a lawyer. That I haven't really heard much about. Uh, I haven't heard uh, this about this combination very often. So why is a serial entrepreneur and a pedigreed uh, engineer is also a lawyer? Well, it's actually a question that I get quite often. And I remember when I first graduated from law school, I was, th there was very few of us. <laughs> I mean, you, you have a computer science background. So, you know, we have, uh, I think, some similar thinking about this, but there was very, and there still is, there's very few people who have, in general, the tech background, and the um, legal background. That's a very, I think, unique uh, skill set in general. And so I, I guess the question is like, why would I leave tech? I mean, you know, tech is cool, you know, it's always been cool, right? It's got that, you know, kind of, um, you know, mystique or whatever to it. And, and, you know, when we think about the top 50 companies, you know, we think of Apple, Facebook. So, um, you know, but for me, the reason I went into law, which is very different than the reason I started my legal briefcase in Alluvion, but the reason I went into law was that, you know, I didn't love what I was doing. So I was an engineer, I was a programmer, you could say, I was um, designing very um, at a very low level silicon chips. So I was a, um, what they call it, an ASIC designer. And uh, which is, you know, in, engineering in, a, in that kind of area, that's a very, you know, competitive field. It's hard to kind of get into. So um, I was good at, at the engineering part of it, but I just didn't love it. It wasn't like I came to work and I was like, oh, yes, I'm working. It was like, yes, I'm going <laughs> to the office and I'm here again. Um, but so I, I kind of have always had in my life that you follow I've always followed my passion or I've always kind of followed um, what at that moment was really interesting to me. So, you know, even engineering, I didn't start off in engineering when I went to university, I started off in math. So I was really good at math uh, when I was in, you know, high school. And so, and, and, and when you're in high school and I was 17, like, what do you do? Right. And so, you know, I'm, 
Asian. So I, my choices were kind of limited, you know, I, I kind of really had an interest in like fashion and art and stuff and history. And my dad's like, nope, <laughs> you know, that doesn't make money. <laughs> you got to be a doctor or you got to be an engineer or you got to be an accountant you know those are the approved subjects right so um so yeah so i ended up in um waterloo in their math department and when i was at waterloo um you know it, it, i was in this very niche subject area and uh some of the advice that i got from some of the professors is that you know it's very niche um and so I thought, okay, well, what else could I do? And I remember going into the basement of the uh, University of Waterloo Engineering Building. And at that time, all the jobs, like the co-op, they have this co-op program at Waterloo. Um, and the co-op board, it was like just this lopsided board where almost all the jobs were computer science, electrical engineering, computer engineering. And then there was this corner where they had like the other jobs. <laughs> it was like, you know, very slim pickings, you know, for the other jobs. And so I thought, you know, if I'm gonna do something, I should do something in this area. And I was good in math and, and you know, that was a path that I could, I could take. So then I ended up in electrical engineering, which is very much like applied math and, um, yeah, and I thought that was, you know, it was a good kind of move for me. It was uh, opened up a lot of opportunities. I got to participate in the co-op program. Um, and when I graduated, it was in a really hot market. So imagine you're back in the late 90s. It was, you know, the first tech boom. It was just crazy. And we were young graduates. And I remember a lot of us getting very good jobs, you know, the you know these young people we were like sought after right and at that time you know tech was still you know there wasn't a lot of people who, who were going into tech it was still kind of like you know earlier days and so i i graduated and i um found myself um at a startup and i you know i worked for four or five years in the industry before i I went to um, Stanford and before I went to law school. So, you know, I, I worked at startups um, and I worked in, you know, bigger kind of tech companies. But uh, so I gave it a chance, but it wasn't my passion. So at the end of the day, um, that's what kind of led me to law. Right. But um... If you look at your pre-law school uh, experience, I think you get some clues about your uh, interest in justice. And correct me if I'm wrong. So I see, um, so you went to law school to UFT uh, in 2004, correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay, so before that, you were a treasurer with Amnesty International. At Stanford, yeah, at Stanford University, yeah. Right, so why would an engineer, I mean, I know engineers, okay? It's, I'm not saying they are uh, blind to justice issues or, but they're nerds, right? So they're really obsessed with, with, with what they do. And, but you went to uh, Amnesty International uh, as a treasurer. So you were interested in justice issues at the time. You also, uh, worked as a volunteer with a uh, housing uh, community services organization yes. before law school. You and uh, somewhat differently, you uh, helped organize. You helped organize uh, something for the Fashion Design Council of Canada before law school. All right. So, are those the, the, they, the, they didn't these initiatives didn't come from your parents. No, uh, un unlike the, your engineering path. So what happened there? Is this is this the origin of your interest in justice? Well, so I, I even in undergrad, I had taken some courses in law um, and I had been interested. I'm pretty avid reader. 
um, even from a very young age, um, always been kind of interested in legal issues. I even in high school took a law course, <laughs> but like, you know, that wasn't a path. <laughs> that wasn't one of the paths that I, I told you. And so, um, you know, yeah, you're right. Um, I would say that the extracurricular activities that you mentioned, that was part of a process of discovery. So I knew that I wasn't, you know, this wasn't what made me passionate. Like engineering didn't make me, you know, kind of get up in the morning and it wasn't what drove me. And um, I knew that I had some other interests. And so, you know, volunteering and um, in these organizations, it was, first it was good, it was good for the community, but it was also like, um, you know, kind of a process of discovery for myself. And uh, yeah, and it was the, at Stanford, that's when I kind of decided to apply and go to law school because I took um, another law course there. And like you said, I volunteered with Amnesty. But, you know, just before we started this, we were talking about the 2000. So, you know, the, just imagine the environment in California in 2004. So, um, you know, it's after, um, or I mean, I went to Stanford and it was 2001. So in 2001, we just, you know, it was just in the kind of cloud or the, you know, shadow of um, 9-11. And um, that's when I started at Stanford. And Stanford, um, you know, being in California, uh, it's not as activist as Berkeley, but it's quite activist. And so, you know, there's a, there's a number of student groups that are, you know, quite vocal about, you know, protesting government and, and stuff like that. So there was a, a pretty vibrant kind of community around that. And then before, just before um, Bush was elected, um, I remember Clinton kind of going around the world and, um, you know, talking about, you know, injustice and talking about um, genocide because there had been, you know, specific things that had happened and, and um, that really resonated with me. So I think, you know, kind of, you know, that climate being in California, um, then being at Stanford, I think that those were things that kind of led me into law. And was law school everything you thought it would be? No. <laughs> It wasn't at all what I thought it was going to be. And um, it, it was, you know, it, but it wasn't bad. It wasn't that I disliked it. I loved my subjects. I loved, you know, I, I loved contracts. Like I loved all of the, all of the courses that we took. Um, but it was just very different. I thought, you know, my kind of vision of the law was very much a human rights and criminal kind of you know, focus. And then when I got into law school, I realized that there was so much more. And, um, but when you, I, I'm a graduate from University of Toronto, and I, I think a number of law students can probably, or lawyers can probably appreciate this. When I was at University of Toronto, um, and I didn't have the guidance that some, some people might have, like in terms of mentors, maybe there's family members, maybe there's somebody that they knew. Uh, I didn't really have that. So, um, you know, my peers were kind of some of, some of my advisors or some of my kind of, um, you know, counselors, you would say. And at University of Toronto, the, the real kind of push for most of the students is to follow that, you know, OCI, Base street path. That's what you do. Like, you know, you got to find articles and you go through the OCIs and you get your job. And, um, and so, you know, that I ended up finding myself going through that path like everybody else. But uh, you did follow that path successfully. You articled at Galvings. And uh, the following year, after you finished your articles in 2009, the following year in 2010, you founded My Legal Briefcase. So why did you do that? Why did you start uh, a, a tech company after articles? And uh, what was My Legal Briefcase all about at the time? Yeah, so um, I graduated <clears throat> and got called to the bar in 2009. So I articled basically 
during the great financial crisis, right? Um, and the large firms were impacted. They were disproportionately impacted because a lot of their clients were big multinational clients. Um, and so like many students who graduated during that time, uh, I found myself not being hired back. Um, it was a, uh, you know, that was tough because <laughs> that was a really tough time. But I was, uh, you know, it wasn't that you didn't, there was an opportunity there. Could, I could have like, artic, I could have like interviewed I, um, and found another position. But, um, you know, that was actually in some ways a blessing because it forced me out of that path. Like imagine it hadn't been 2008, it had been any other year, <laughs> you know, I probably would have like continued to work at Gowlings. I, I would probably still be at Gowlings. <laughs> like, you know, that, that probably would have been what happened, but life, you know, happens sometimes and you find yourself at, at this moment and you're like, well, what do I do? And so, you know, one of the things that I found working in the law firm is that um, is that it was really geared towards people who were younger, like who graduated university, like undergrad, and then went to law school, and they were in their twenties, and you know, you know, most likely not married, definitely not kid, didn't have kids, and they were ready to work, you know. And um, but I was different. I had uh, worked a whole other career before going into law and I had a child. And so I was, you know, it was, uh, you know, they assume that you have a certain level of maturity and you have a certain level of knowledge. And I felt like I was bringing a lot more to the table that wasn't being um, utilized or appreciated. And um, so I said, well, I'm not going to go back into that environment. I know what that environment looks like. That's, that's not for me. Um, and so, and at that time, I remember thinking uh, that the law firms, there was just this gap in terms of process, uh, in terms of technology. Um, and I remember they, they had all the technology. It, was, it wasn't a matter of um, them having the technology, it's just a matter of using it. Um, and I saw a lot of opportunity in that, um, especially coming from, you know, working in California and working at these really, you know, top kind of tech companies, um, you know, the mindset, the engineering mindset and the law mindset is very different. Yes, uh, the, and allow me to venture uh, my opinion on how they are different. And uh, then I will ask you a question about how you reconcile them. So the, the, the legal mindset is about uh, identifying uh, uh, risks and building walls to prevent clients from wading into those risks. And the engineering mindset is about um, uh, solving problems uh, by going, uh, by, by taking risks and by uh, uh, preventing uh, certain uh, worst case scenarios uh, through technology. So engineers think that technology can solve any problem and lawyers think that law can solve only so many problems, but uh, not everything, right? What do you think about this take? Um, I think you're right. And I would say there's a few other things I would say as well is that, um, you know, to your, to, you know, I agree with what you said about engineers. I would say to even, you know, emphasize it even more is that we're always looking to, instead of like uh, doing something 10 times in a very efficient way, we'll find a way to automate it so we don't have to do it. Um, so it's a way of thinking about your environment in a way that's like very like problem solving and very kind of, um, you know, thinking about the future, you know, thinking about how you could do something and then the rewards in the future. Um, whereas I think with law, 
it, first of all, it can be very immediate because somebody comes to you, they have a problem and then they want a solution and they want that solution right now. Um, and so it's, it's addressing people as you go and it's looking at the past to predict the future. So instead of being future looking, it's, um, it's like kind of, you know, looking at the historical stuff. It's not really, it's not really looking to the future. Yes, lawyers uphold tradition by following precedent. Engineers regularly destroy tradition by disrupting uh, existing uh, technologies or existing companies. Now, did you destroy and disrupt <laughs> with my legal briefcase? And what did you destroy and disrupt with my legal briefcase? Well, when I started, um, in, at that time, there was very little in legal tech, uh, especially in Toronto. There was very, very li little in terms of like online SaaS based or types of delivery of legal services. Um, you know, it's still, um, there's been a huge boom, but it's still not at the same place as other industries. Like if we think about FinTech or you know, what's happening in retail, what's happening in, uh, what's happened to publishing, you know, so, uh, you know, in my mind, it's coming, you know, it's, it's happening slower, but it's coming. And, and when we get to a certain impetus, like once we get to a certain point, the acceleration will happen even rapidly. So, um, but my point is, is that at that time, even doing anything, was just was kind of like whoa what are you doing <laughs> you know it was kind of looked at cautiously and um oh yeah that's something different so um i i think that it you know it led to um thinking about you know hey we could start to think about uh doing this um you know kind of online stuff um but yeah i you know, one of the things, I don't know if you ever participated, but one of the things that we did, or I did, was involved in was something called um, Law Tech Camp. And it was I did. a- I participated in it. I also and, started a tech company at the time. <laughs> and so uh, it was a bringing together of people who were like-minded, who, who were thinking about law and technology, because I just really, really felt alone at that time. And so I remember Noah Weisberg, who has started Cura, has been really successful. Um, but I remember him and his partner and, and being there and giving this like, you know, set, you know, discussion about how do you how do you do this legal tech uh, thing? And so, you know, that was innovative, too. So there was, I think, just kind of being there at the beginning was just a way to show people that, you know, there's, there's other things that we could be doing. So basically advocacy by example, <laughs> progress by example, I'm just going to build stuff and I'm going to show you that it's possible and you guys do whatever you want, but I'm just going to do it. <laughs> and I think this, this describes your, your approach. And I think it's amazing um, I definitely didn't have your stamina and your commitment. You were committed to um, this approach for at least 10 years, and it eventually paid off. But before we jump to the present, I want to talk about Alluvian. That was a law firm, right? Or is a law firm? It is a law firm, yes. And that, that is another of your companies that you started yes. and exited successfully. So tell us about that. Why is it not an ordinary law firm? What did you do? You had an opportunity to build a law firm from scratch. You went to Waterloo, you went to Stanford, you went to U of T Law, you uh, observed the state of this industry for years, and then you have this opportunity to build a law firm from scratch. What did you do? So the impetus behind Alluvion was some of the learnings from uh, my legal briefcase. And so what I found when I was um, working on my legal briefcase was that there was a number of people who were coming to the site and that my legal briefcase, it just didn't fit for them for whatever reason. 
And, um, but they needed uh, legal services and they didn't, they couldn't afford to pay as much. And surprisingly, there's a large number of people who fit that category. It's not just, uh, you know, uh, people under a certain kind of income level. It's the middle class. And there's been, as you, as you probably know, <laughs> there's been a lot of discussion, uh, even with the judiciary, about how um, legal services are not accessible to the middle class. So what I found was that um, a number of professionals, a, a number of business owners, uh, not being able to afford legal services. So Alluvion um, was... Um, let's take take technology and let us redesign or think about the processes and deliver uh, those legal services in a different way. And so, for example, um, in corporations, um, you know, what a lot of that is like kind of precedence, you know, it's, uh, you, you know what you did last time, you change up the documents and then you give it to the next person. Well, why can't you use document automation to do that? So, so basically, Alluvion was a traditional law firm uh, spliced with your tech startup to create this new DNA of a tech startup infused law firm where the actual law firm founder was an engineer. So there was not a question of buying something from vendors to implement it. You just build things. Is this, is this a fair description of what happened? Yes, yeah. And at that time, there wasn't a lot that was available, right? So actually now there's, uh, we're in this interesting time because there's a lot of new technology that's available in the market. And, you, and as a law firm, you can look at that and you can really think about how you could maybe redesign how you're doing certain processes and stuff. But at that time, um, there wasn't, there wasn't, you know, the number of companies out there, the number of solutions that were available, um, there, it was much less. Um, I remember, Gulab, I remember when you were starting out, you asked me, um, you know, what should I use for practice management software? And I, I told you I'm using Clio, and uh, and so you looked at that, and I remember, uh, I think you you used Clio, um, and but Clio is a nice example because that was really easy to use. I've used that for years. Now they've developed a whole ecosystem. Um, they have they have uh, document automation. They have intake forms. So so that's like that wasn't available you know, <laughs> when we started, right? It was really, it was really new. I remember that conversation, even though it took place about nine years ago. I even <laughs> remember the restaurant where we had lunch. I, I remember too. <laughs> yeah, it was really early and Clio was like uh, a, a revelation. Ooh, things like that exist, especially after the uh, traditional package that will remain unnamed that really drove me nuts. <laughs> Yeah, so that that's that's a great that's a great anecdote. Uh, I uh, you really uh, uh, stirred my memories. Uh, but the curious thing about uh, Alluvion and my legal briefcase is that you were very much the the talent there in the sense that you built the technology. You didn't just run those organizations. You actually built the technology yourself. Uh, what happened after Alluvian? So you continued working on my legal briefcase. You continued practicing law. How did that lead you eventually to Caraval and why you ended up there? Um, well, I've known Joe and Robson for a very long time. I met, I've met, I met them like maybe around the time I met you. Um, and um so we so i started having conversations with um with uh joe maybe it's maybe it's been a year <laughs> so it's it takes time these things but um you know uh, you know the discussions where uh we want to 
kind of do some different stuff around technology, um, which, you know, what I, what I love about, what I've always loved about what they're doing is that they've, they've also been very innovative, right? Much more, you know, if I think about some, somebody in the legal field in Toronto and in Canada, like I really, you know, they're, they're kind of like an example to me. Um, and they leveraged when they first started, they leveraged all these cloud-based technologies that a lot of lawyers were scared to use because right. they were, uh, maybe they were reluctant to adopt or maybe they were afraid of the cloud, whatever it was. But they leveraged those cloud-based technologies to like develop this, um, you know, working from home and cutting mm -hmm. out the overhead model and then passing those savings on to their clients and, um, and, and did very well with that model. So now you fast forward and it's like 2020 <laughs> and we're in COVID and, and everybody, everybody is working from, from home. home. <laughs> yeah. These guys have, these guys were visionaries. What can I say? But, um, but we're working from home, not because, you know, we want to uh, all the time um, we're forced into this position, but it's accelerated. We're in this moment right now uh, in law in this very interesting moment, like a year ago, if you told me that we would be doing e-filing for our um, court cases, I would have said, no, <laughs> You're, you know, get out of here. That's not gonna happen, right? We, we have that like in, in such a short period of time. So um, we're doing Zoom hearings, lots of, lots of, uh, interesting changes have occurred in the last six months. Uh, so we're in this moment. Um, and I think uh, that moment is, um, changes things, changes things for the industry. So. Caravel Law used to be known as Cognition LLP, right? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, so Cognition LLP for years was the coolest brand among law firms that provided uh, an alternative to the elite Bay Street model and uh, that basically gave companies uh, a part-time or temp in-house counsel, if, if I understand this model correctly. And the lawyers worked from anywhere. It didn't matter to clients. They sometimes came to clients' premises but this is where technology really kicked in. They, they understood that technology enabled lawyers to work from anywhere and deliver services faster and uh, more efficiently, but also with fewer errors, right? Is this uh, something uh, uh, more or less accurate? I would say so, yes. Right, and, but today Caraval Law, of course, we know it under a different name, but is it essentially the same model? Yes, uh, it is that uh, virtual, like they call they call virtual in-house or fractional GC model. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also, yeah, there's placement for, you know, in-house departments as well. Uh, but yes, you're correct. This is the right. similar type model. Yeah. Right. So general counsel on demand backed up by technology and years of doing this. Technology is at the heart of, of this whole undertaking. And I speak as someone who uh, could not have started his own practice nine or 10 years ago without technology. This is the only reason I started my own practice because I was born uh, late enough, right? To arrive at that point where technology coalesced sufficiently for me to be able to start my own practice. So Cognition LLP first and Caravel Law owe their existence to technology. Uh, therefore, the position of director of legal innovation is super important, if I, if I understand it correctly, right? It's super important to this company, to this firm. It's a law firm, but you can also see it as a company. Um, uh, but can you tell us more besides, you know, uh, besides the, uh, uh, this uh, brief, description that I just gave that it's super important. Can you tell us more about this position, Director of Legal Innovation, and what exactly is involved 
uh, can, I, can you give us some examples of what the director of legal innovation will do specifically for Caraval Law? And maybe what other law firms can do to emulate that Right. model or have the similar role in their within their own structure right um and that's a interesting question and an interesting point you made about a company because uh it is a law firm but it is very much set up like a company in that there's a ceo and there's sales people and there's marketing people um which not all law firms have this kind of structure um, and even if they do have this structure, it's not always, there's there's sometimes this consensus, like, you know, decision-making by consensus, which isn't, which you don't find in Careval. The second, the second thing, going back to your previous question about why Careval Law, like, why did I join them? Um, one of the thing, reasons that I was attracted to that is that Joe and Robson have always been very entrepreneurial. And that is, like you said before, um, I'm entrepreneurial as well. And so part of joining them is this mindset, you know, this kind of like, um, um, you know, feeling like-minded people, working with people who are like-minded. Now, it's a very different mindset to be entrepreneurial than not to be entrepreneurial. And it's, and it's really hard to describe to people what that means, but it's this you know, you talked about risk taking, but the, it's this willingness to try new things. So, you know, you know, you asked me for examples of what we're doing. If I give you examples, it might not sound like we're doing anything very different than other law firms, but the difference, the main difference is that we're starting from a different place. We're starting from people who are entrepreneurial and even the lawyers who work with us, they join us because they want to have a different lifestyle. They want to have, or they they kind of agree that things have to change. So it's it's uh, we're working with a different set of uh, people, and I think this is this is what's going to really kind of distinguish us in terms of uh, moving forward, or even up until now, is this um, entrepreneurial mindset. So moving forward with projects that we have, um, uh, for example. Uh, some of the projects we've we've starting to work on this uh, solution of uh, uh, startup solution package um, that will have a combination of lawyer uh, advice as well as technology. Okay, you can say, yeah, there's other companies who are doing the same thing, but the real difference is that it doesn't get used. Like there are places where, and I gave you the example of back to when I articled where you know you have this firm it has all the technology but it's it's just the process is not embedded it's not being used it's not you know people don't walk the walk and so so i think that's what's really different here are you guys looking at legal services as more of a product than a service is this something, this is a very risky proposition, right? For most lawyers. <laughs> and uh, I think most lawyers will stay away from even considering that. But um, you told me about incorporations and uh, uh, you told me about how Alluvion handled incorporations through document automation. This is basically, to me, this is basically uh, approaching legal services as a product rather than a service, or at least as a hybrid between the product and the service. So lawyers always, most lawyers always approach their work as a service. That's why they bill by the hour. Um, of course, uh, sometimes you cannot help but use product ideas, especially if you have a volume practice. So uh, personal injury lawyers, will have massive marketing campaigns. This comes straight from the product playbook. In general, the idea of marketing was um, not welcome in the legal industry for many years, right? In some jurisdictions, it was prohibited to advertise yourself, right? So marketing, the notion of marketing comes from the product playbook. 
what other things uh, did you borrow from the product playbook besides marketing, technology, sales, uh, the uh, hierarchy, management hierarchy, having a CEO, any other product playbook ideas at Caravel? Um, well, I'm not sure that I fully understand um, the product playbook, but um, you know, when I think about a company, um, I think you know very much inspired by technology, and um, in technology companies, what I think they do really good job about, like I mean, you know, they might be famous for, let's say, you know, Google is famous for a search engine, but internally. Um, they're very good about innovating in every single way. So it's not just about um, innovation in terms of, oh, we're going to improve the search engine. It's, you know, innovation in terms of how are we doing work? You know, they have this whole dog fooding, for example, um, uh, you know, idea at Google. Um, you know, what you build, you know, eat what you build kind of thing. Um, so you know, that kind of mindset, I think, is what is important, is are always looking at every little thing that you do and thinking about how you could do it differently and how you could do it better. So, for example, we have some uh, person whose role is called, it's called a client happiness. So she's just supporting clients and making sure that they're happy. That's her role. Um, so how many law firms have person who's in charge of client happiness. Uh, we ask our um, clients uh, to give us uh, feedback. So after they finish, we finish, lawyer finishes a uh, job, uh, they fill out this very brief survey. And so we track that. So we have like an NPS score. So how, how many law firms have an NPS score? These are all things that are borrowed from that, you know, we're talking about like tech and successful, you know, companies, you know, so instead of looking at what are other law firms doing? What are other successful companies doing, right? How do we like keep moving the envelope forward? And if I uh, just made me think of Mad Men, the TV show, they had uh, client happiness people in the fifties <laughs> at, at, at agencies, which could be a good analogy for law firms, but for some reason they're not because law firms don't have client happiness people. But I remember in the show, and pardon me using a TV show as a source, but uh, almost all of the main characters were client happiness people. That's why they were alcoholics, right? <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, it's, really, it's really bizarre that law firms uh, haven't paid much attention to that. But, and I know that lawyers play that role. Lawyers are both the practitioners and client happiness people and um, sales people and marketers. Right. And uh, I don't know, I mean, many lawyers are smart and talented, but probably uh, their heads are still not big enough to wear so many hats. And uh, it's interesting that Caravel uh, is reforming that. And I, I know that they have been doing that for years. Why have this model, and that's one of my uh, final questions really, why have this model not uh, spread and multiplied uh, at scale in uh, Canada or North America? Why, why uh, the predominant model is still the traditional law firm model? Um, I think there's two, two reasons. One is um, tradition. Like we, let's go back to the beginning of our conversation. You know, the engineering mindset, the law, lawyer mindset, you know, and the lawyer mindset working from the point of tradition. And when you graduate, from law school and you article, um, you're, be, you're still kind of learning through that apprentice style model. Um, and you're basically told, this is how things go. You're usually your ideas and, and thoughts aren't really you know, solicited and, and asked for. And you're kind of told, hey, this is how we do things. You follow that path, that's what, that's what you do. So I think that um, has hampered kind of innovation in this space. Um, and the second is, uh, I take issue with what you say. I think there actually is quite a bit of innovation. So when Cognition first started, they were the only ones. 
But now we can see that there's CEO law, there's conduit, there is um, Axiom, there is McCarthy's has, um, has their own service. So I think there is actually some adoption and, and change that we're seeing. Not as much as maybe you would see in another industry, but yes, um, I think there is change. Well, on this uh, optimistic note, I think it's truly optimistic to uh, say that the change is happening in the industry. On this optimistic note, I want to express my gratitude today for uh, your time, for joining uh, us today and uh, talking about this interesting path of yours. It's, it was really fascinating. Uh, a lot of the things that you said, they really resonated with me uh, in, in, in the sense that, oh, I could have done that, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's really inspiring. It was really inspiring to listen to you. You're always a role model. And I appreciate that you freely share your experience and, uh, and knowledge. Uh, thank you so much, Monica. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Pulat. Thank you for having me on your show. I really appreciate it.